Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Infineon with Sandeep Krishnagauda. We're going to talk today about LPDDR flash in automotive. Sandeep, as cars move toward a lot more electrification, obviously there's a lot more flash that's coming in, a lot more chips. What's different about LPDDR flash? Thanks, Ed. So let's, let's take it a broader picture of what's happening as an industry trend towards decarbonization and digitalization. When we think about decarbonization, we're seeing CO2 emissions, energy efficiency, digitalization refers to more with regards to uh, improving the productivity, saving cost, making it easy for us. In, in the new electrical vehicles that are coming out, the, the aspects of you know, moving from the flat ECU-based architecture towards a domain architecture, towards now a zonal architecture, will enable what we refer to as the software-defined vehicles. And when you move towards software-defined vehicles, there's a, there's a new zonal controllers that actually has, has to take a lot of inputs from the uh, radars, the LIDARs, the cameras, process at real time and make real time decisions before it sends it to the full computer. This aspect of real time compute where things are becoming safety critical is really important. So the industry has to move to very advanced nodes now. Um, people are moving the processors from uh, you know, what used to be a 40 nanometer technology towards a 16 nanometer or five nanometer technology in automotive with multi-core processors. When that happens, there are a few challenges in the industry that triggers the need. First, the, the key aspect is in advanced nodes, you don't have any viable embedded flash technology at all. In, if that's the case, then the, the processors now have to depend on an external memory. And this is where we come into the need of dependence of safety critical applications being directly executed from an external memory. And that's where SemperX, which is the new LPDDR flash, comes into uh, action. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Sandeep, what are we looking at? Yeah, so this is how the classic MCUs today look like in an ECU where you have multiple cores of CPUs. They have an embedded flash, you have an SRAM, you have a security module, and they depend on an external memory uh, that, you know, through an octal spy, XPy interface where you can execute code from. So where does the code get executed? You keep all the code in the internal embedded flash, you execute through the CPUs, and when you need something external for you know, over-the-air updates or storing data, you use an external memory. Now, coming to what's happening today, you think about the new processors that are coming in you know, design for zonal architectures. You have more number of CPUs that you need to execute. These are running on advanced nodes, so there's no embedded flash, which I highlighted here in red. They still have the embedded SRAM, they still have the security. But in order to do execution of code from an, from an external memory, they have to advance to a new interface like an LPDDR. Now, LPDDR is very common for a DRAM, but when you are trying to execute code where your data is stored in the flash, this is the very first time that in the industry we are bringing an LPDDR flash memory, which offers multiple banks that can be accessed through the different CPUs at real time with the performance of an LPDDR interface. And one of the things about flash is that it keeps whatever you have there, right? It, you turn off the engine, it does not go away. It's, it's there all the time. You're right. That, that's the beauty of it because what used to happen, you know, when you, when you have your core sitting in an external flash, you can now directly execute. You don't have to copy the core to an internal SRAM or you don't have to copy the core to an external DRAM. All of this saves time when you're starting uh, your, your processors and gives you a very instant on fast boot experience. So a few metrics for you. If you're trying to copy about 10 megabytes of data through a standard Octal Spy device, you're probably gonna take about 25 milliseconds. And, and that doesn't work because if you're trying to boot fast and respond to a CAN message in less than 20 milliseconds, that's not ideal. Whereas if you really use an LPDDR flash and now you can execute directly, you can do that in less than three milliseconds. And that's a value that you see 
as more and more safety critical applications get bundled to a zonal controller, there are many more safety applications than what it is there today. So the complexity of the problem has actually gone up and LPDDR flash is a solution to address that. So is part of this the fact that we just have so much data coming into a vehicle now that you have to process it that much faster? Absolutely. I think the key aspect there is the real-time compute needs for a processor, especially for zoner controller. If it's making the decisions, you need to be able to you know, make decisions real-time. You can't depend on the uh, full computer that is there uh, connected to the Ethernet at the back. So you really need to make decisions real-time in a very timely and predictable manner. Hence, executing code directly from a flash makes that easier for the uh, zonal controller architecture in, in, for, for the future. What does software-defined uh, vehicles bring to the table here, and where does this fit in? The, the aspect of software-defined vehicle really comes from the fact that you're able to deploy new applications and services into a vehicle. If your architecture is, is, is based of, you know, you can execute out of an external memory, you have the capability to add more as new applications and services emerge. And the fact that you have multiple cores with a good freedom of interference, you can isolate these different applications and provide the expansion to, to add additional uh, software uh, and applications uh, in the future after the vehicle has been shipped. So the hardware is there to enable what you're going to change, right? It, it's flexible enough that you can do whatever you need to. Absolutely, you're right, yep. The zonal architecture puts a lot of different functions together, right? So how does that change here? What's going on? Th that's a critical point. When you take a zonal controller and you have multiple safety critical, like, you know, radars and LIDARs and cameras information coming in, you need two things, right? You need to be able to have very low latency that comes from the you know, execution of the code that is sitting in an external memory, and also a multi-bank architecture, because you could have each CPU you know, tasked to perform certain uh, applications. And when that is happening, you don't want to have, you know, f you, you don't want to have conflict of who, who accesses which bank. This refers to the concept of freedom of interference. So when you think about a CPU with multiple, multiple banks in the memory, you have to provide a real-time predictable execution, deterministic execution that is predictable in a, a defined maximum time. And this architecture enables you to do that because you can have multiple CPUs accessing any of the bank at every read operation. So there is no a limitation in which CPU can access which bank. So as a, as a software-defined vehicle, you could allocate different banks to the different CPUs that are like executing different tasks. So do more banks add more flexibility in terms of how much data you can process and store? Absolutely, yeah. And it also enables you to have final granularity as you do over-the-air updates. You can define which portion of the code is really getting updated and not the whole memory space. Structurally, what's different here? There are two aspects to it. One, this is the first memory with an LPDDR interface, right, to a NOR flash memory. And you have multiple banks that the processor can access without having any bank conflicts. And just to be clear, this is NOR versus NAND, right? This is a NOR memory. NOR is the ideal perfect memory for execution of code because you have a lot of random transactions that will get executed. Because code is not executed sequentially, in an embedded system. You have a lot of interrupts, especially in a zonal controller, which are safety critical, and you have to process them immediately. That's why NOR is the perfect uh, architecture to fit into an LPDDR flash memory. So what, what really changes when you do have a different interface? I think we, we had to first make the choice, what's the right interface when we were transitioning from a standard Octal XPy towards an LPDDR. So let me get into a bit of the details that tells you the differences. Now, if I use a standard octal interface, which is an XPy, we have about 12 pins, and that offers about 400 megabytes per second, and they use an LVC MOS IO. If you think about an LPDDR interface, you're going to about 32 pins, 
they use an LVSTL I.O. schemes and offer you the scalability up to 6,400 megabytes per second. And those pins are in high demand within some of these architectures, right? So the fewer is better? The fewer is better, but at the cost of performance, that, that is extremely important because you want to offer a path that is scalable in the future. So LPTDR interface offers you several benefits there, which is you can have a single channel and reduce the number of pins. You could, uh, or a by 8 interface, you could have a dual channel uh, and you could have, you, you can scale the performance as well. So the critical aspect though, from, from, from a XPy or an Octal interface to an LPDDR interface is the, the fact that I'm executing code, I need to be able to do random transaction and be able to have a capability to do pipelining. But if you look at the protocol of uh, XPy, uh, the way it works is you, 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 don't, you have a single DQ bus. So you have, you have to provide your command, you have to then provide your address, and then after a certain read latency, you get your data. So if you're really doing like a 32-byte access or 32-byte fetch from the memory, it takes you about 42 clock cycles at 200 megahertz. It's about 210 nanoseconds. And if you want to do that again, then you do it sequentially. So it adds to the next 210. So it's not ideal for uh, executing code at this high performance that the zonal controllers are targeting. Right? So it's, it's running out of steam. The LVCMOS IOs also doesn't scale below about 200 megahertz. So this is limited to 200 megahertz. Right? So you can't just increase the performance and, and go. So why did you have to transition to a new interface? Because there are two aspects. One, we needed the performance for code execution. So we wanted to pipeline the accesses to the memory. And two, the LVC MOS IOs are not capable of running beyond 200 megahertz. So we had to transition to a new interface. And we chose an interface that's already proven in the industry, a standard like LPDDR4, and tried to adapt that to a non-volatile memory. In this case, that is a flash memory. So if you take a look at that, you have about 32 pins that gives you about 6,400 megabytes per second. So how does this benefit? The, the, the key fact is you have the command address bus that is different than the uh, data bus. So what it allows you to do is have command and address for, for what you're trying to fetch. And you can have a read latency cycle. You, you can get your data on your DQ bus. This gives you about 27 clocks at 33.75 nanoseconds. You can see the difference in performance going from 30, 210 to 33.75. Of course, it comes at the benefit of being able to run faster. But also, most importantly, if I want to do a sequential access, I can then assign this to another uh, cycle of command and address here. And my data can be pipelined right here for the next bunch of uh, cycles. This is extremely important because it gives you 100% data bus efficiency of what you're trying to target. So it's not that you couldn't get as much memory and speed as you wanted in the past, but you couldn't do it efficiently, right? So this actually, you have more data, you have more things that you have to check, particularly as, as cars become increasingly uh, autonomous as they start looking at uh, this is what is this object in the road what do I have to communicate with and you have to get that data very very quickly but you have to do it in a way that doesn't sap the power out of your battery because this is now all battery powered right absolutely I, th I think you, you 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 get to the right point so if I look at the comparison from a standard XPy to a LPDDR flash I get about 8x higher bandwidth uh, I'm able to get 8x, you know, the data 8x faster. Uh, most importantly, with the pipelining, I'm able to achieve over 20x faster random transactions. And, you know, you'll be surprised to see, note also that this is not coming at a higher power envelope. I'm actually getting lower 8x lower energy per uh, megabit of data transaction. And that happens on two folds. One, I moved from an LV, uh, uh, LVC MOS architecture where you were doing full swing to uh, LVSTL, which is a lower power uh, uh, I.O. scheme. And this enables you to get to you know, uh, lower power. Uh, so you keep the same envelope, you're running faster, so it's less energy that you're consuming with, with the accesses. All memory has interface standards. 
what happens here? Is this has this been supported by the rest of the industry? The the, the LPDDR is a standard industry uh, interface. Now attaching, you know, that's very common for a DRAM, but attaching that to a non-volatile memory like a flash is new. What we have done working with JREG is uh, through the committee have an approval to start a new task group, a TCG task group for LPDDR flash standardization. So we're working with the industry partners in this case to actually collaborate to define, uh, take, make this a standard, but also establish the future of Gen 1 and Gen 2 products that have the capability to address even more additional compute needs. The compute needs are only going to grow in a car as we do more software-defined vehicles. So we see this as a start of a journey, and we believe this is the right architecture choice for our customers to make for a very uh, cost-efficient solution. Sandeep Krishnagowda, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you.